Look, I doubt it would surprise anybody that at clergy events, they give me the IT jobs. I don't think it would surprise anybody that I get roped in to run the computer and the slides and do all of that stuff for all of the clergy. At each conference, I'm there hours before everybody else, who sometimes leave in the day before setting everything up. And I'm there the last to leave as well, every morning, every day. Come the lunchtime talks, you know, the one just after lunch where everyone just kind of naps because you're digesting your food and you've kind of had enough. Well, I've got to stay awake and pay attention and nobody cares. No, no. Look, the thing about IT work is if you do your job really, really good, nobody notices. But if you muck it up, if you stuff things up, then everybody notices and you are most certainly the fool. It's a thankless job. And to prove my point, at the end of every single conference, they wheel out the, you know, the keynote speaker, they hand them a, a bunch of flowers, maybe a bottle of wine, and they're like, oh, thank you. And then they bring up the person who spoke after lunch, you know, 10 minutes they spoke for, nobody cares or remembers. They get a box of chocolates. Do you think the IT guy even gets a mention? completely forgotten. Sometimes they'll say, oh, look, thanks to the IT. You know, the whole time I'm sitting there smiling and nodding, people bring me their slides three seconds before they want them on the screen. And I just like, yeah, thanks for that. I'll, I'll make that happen. Yeah, that's me. Never gets a mention. Now, I've got that off my chest. I wonder if what Paul, Paul is doing here, I wonder if Paul feels a bit like the IT guy to the Galatian church, to the Galatians. He's doing all the work. He's getting there early, laying this foundation for others, only discover that the people have lost the plot. They've gone off the rails. They're listening to a different gospel. Their PowerPoints are green text on blue background. They've gone and shoved like a whole chapter of a book into one slide and then expect, and then when no one can read it, they blame the IT guy. That's what's happening here. Trust me. No. Paul comes out, Galatians, he's all guns blazing, isn't he? And the first thing he does is establish his authority. Unlike the IT guy who got his credentials in his parents' basement playing games, this guy, Paul, knows what he's talking about. Three things before letting it rip he gives us. First thing, he talks about his authority. His authority to preach and teach. What gives him the right to say the things he does? He then talks about his motives. His motives are not to please people. If he wanted to please people, he would have stayed in Judaism. No, no, his motives are to please God. We're going to talk about that. And then, of course, his message. His message is faith is enough. It's not Christ plus something equals salvation. It's simply faith. Faith in Christ, he is enough. Well, unless I go off the rails some more, or I try to upstage Uncle Nath on Friday night, a few of us got there. The hall was packed. I think we have 60 chairs and there might have been three spare. So that was wonderful. It was such a wonderful night on Friday. Great outreach. All right, I'm going to pray. We're going to open up. So if you've got your books ready, we're going to open up Galatians chapter 1. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your great love. I open our hearts and minds to your word today. Amen. Well, this is how he starts. Paul, an apostle sent not from men nor by a man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers and sisters with me. Kind of right from the get-go, Paul's making clear that he's no ordinary teacher. His authority to speak comes from Christ himself. And with this authority, he does speak to the churches in Galatia, first of all. Grace and peace to you, he says, from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the smiling and nodding before he gets to the real meat in the sandwich, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father. Not only does Paul have the authority to teach, but they would do well to listen to him. Why? Because the stakes could not be higher. The dangers could not be greater. As this age is one that is full of sin. This is an evil age, no less. And that's what Paul is upset about. The gospel that he preaches is the one that saves, not the perversion that they've taken on board and are following. Over the next few weeks, we're gonna, Paul is going to slowly kind of unpack for us the true gospel, 
I mean, he does it in almost every word, in a sense, but he will talk about their, what they've perverted towards. And the, the essence of it all is simply they've added something. They've gone faith plus something equals salvation. It might be faith plus works. Or it might be faith plus circumcision. It's Christ is not enough. There's something they're adding on. And sadly, the Galatians won't be the last to make such a big and grave mistake. I mean, this is why we had a Reformation. This is what Martin Luther's 95 Theses was all about. On his famous list, he detailed exactly the reasons why the early church, the medieval Catholic church, was in error. The plus stuff they had added to Christ for salvation. There's lots more to come on this. But what about Paul? What are his motives? Why, why is he speaking up? Well, have a look at verse 10. We're going to jump around a little bit. Am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? If I was still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. So Paul has the authority to speak. I'm, I'm not done on that. I want to make sure we really get this, that Paul has the authority to speak for God. It's so important as we read the New Testament. We'll come back to it. But why does he speak? What are his motives? Well, unlike his authority, his motives are very easy to test. We can ask two questions of Paul. The first one is, what, what has he given up in order to speak up? So what is Paul giving up in order to speak up? And the second question we can ask of Paul is, what does he do gain by speaking out? Now, a good mentor will pass both these tests. Oh, I do have that there. Wow. A good mentor will pass both these tests. And equally, a good parent shall pass these tests too. Now, if I was to speak beyond my expertise, and I never do that, I was to speak beyond my expertise. I might say that this is the problem with much of parenting today. What's going on with parenting today? Many parents are only giving up what they're forced to give up, kind of the responsibility that's thrust upon them that they really can't ignore, the crying baby, for example. Now, I don't know about you, but I go down to our local park and I, I see a bunch of kids playing on the swings and all that stuff and digging in the sand. And then I see a whole line of parents on their phones, staring at their screens. Now, I might be wrong, but I don't think that sacrifice. There's a lot more I could say about it. Parents failing to give up me time, screen time, TV time, snack time, in order to be with their children. Let's get back to Paul. What has Paul given up? Well, verse 13, he's given up a lot. For you have heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. So Paul's backstory is one of persecuting the Christians, one of persecuting the early church. And his work of persecuting Christians was received with honour, and glory, and the accolade of men. Promotion by his peers in Judaism. If Paul wanted to please people, then he wouldn't have left. That's what he's saying. If his motives was to, motive was to make a name for himself, then he would still be persecuting the church, the Christian group that he is now part of. Now we only need to look at verse 22 to see, down the bottom, to see that this is all the churches in Judea knew about him. All they knew about him was that he was a persecutor, says that he was a persecutor of the church. Which means in order to speak up, Paul has given up fame, institutional authority, and the respect of powerful people. It's kind of like one of our politicians giving up the top job to go work in the mailroom. It wouldn't happen. The scum always floats to the surface, yeah? That was a cheap shot. What does Paul have to gain? Nothing, it would seem. Paul has nothing to gain by going back to the mailroom. But 
He does state where else, elsewhere in the Bible what he has gained. For to live is Christ, says Paul in Philippians 1. Christ lives in me, he says in the very next chapter of Galatians. We belong to the Lord, he says in Romans 14. But from any worldly perspective, Paul has nothing to gain, everything to lose. So Paul, with the accolade of men behind him, with the love of Christ in him and ahead of him, he's able to explain the message that changed his life, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he does it with complete integrity. Which brings us to our third point, Paul's message. Oh, I did have a few points there. Oh, good. Third point, Paul's message. Verse 11. No, I've got to go back one. There it is. No, oh, I've jumped all over the place. Clearly, I've just had a busy week. Verse 11, skip the slides. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, we've got Bibles in front of us, easy peasy. Verse 11, that the gospel I preached is not of human origin. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. Paul's authority is a divine authority. His message is a divine message. One received by revelation from the risen Jesus Christ himself. Now, does this make Paul some kind of Muhammad in a cave, listening to an angel and jotting down notes? Hardly. Firstly, nothing Paul has to say isn't collaborated with the rest of Scripture, with the other apostles and their teachings, with the four Gospels. Paul is no island. His way is not the highway. But Christ's way, certainly. It is Christ's way or the highway, that's for sure. Secondly, Paul was a an experienced teacher of the Hebrew Scriptures, of the Old Testament. Now, part of their training, they had to know the first five books of the Bible by rote. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. From memory. They had to be able to say the whole thing. So he knew his Scriptures, and he knew them well. In summary, Paul's message is one of divine inspiration. But Paul is no island. In fact, his teaching, it lines up perfectly with the other four Gospels and the teachings of the other apostles. I mean, Peter does at one say, point out that, that Paul's teaching is hard to take. No kidding. But it does line up perfectly. And he didn't even know them. Now, what does that say? He didn't even know them. Only this, uh, this Gospel is the same Gospel we see right through the Scriptures. It can only come together by the power of the Spirit because he didn't even know them. Have a look at verse 15. But when God, who set me apart from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his Son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles. We are the Gentiles. My immediate response was not to consult any human being. I did not go up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before I was that I went to Arabia, later I returned to Damascus. He goes on to explain that it wasn't for another three years before he met some of the other apostles, and just James, right, and the others briefly. Now let's just pause here and kind of be a bit honest with ourselves and the scriptures just for a moment. For the non-believer, even those a bit kind of Christians, a bit sceptical of miracles, those questioning Paul's words and authority, Because it sits in contradiction to their own experience. Paul's words often sit in contradiction to our feelings and our desires. For you, I imagine that the idea that Paul's message is one from God, it's a divine message, well, it can be a, a bit hard to take, a bit difficult to receive, but is it really? Anyone who's been in Christian ministry for three seconds knows that what I'm about to say happens all the time. A missionary desperately needing some money in order to, to do some work or support someone in the field. Before they've even finished praying, the phone rings and someone's on the phone saying, I've got some money for you. And it happens to be the exact amount they need to do the mission. I've heard this story firsthand from so many people. And it's happened in my own life. Getting a call, literally, the day after we prayed to sell the business that was holding us back from stepping in 
to ministry. Now, I don't know if I've shared the story before, but Ali and I, when we decided to go into ministry, and we do this together, I know I'm the one who's been priested, but Ali is a pastor every bit as much as I am. And when we decided to go into ministry, I kept working. I mean, you've got to put food on the table, right? So I was working full time, running a business. I then started doing a theology that was part time. I was doing 20 hours a week in the church. I was doing CPE, which is another full time course, all at the same time. And it got a bit much. Got a bit much. Come Christmas, come Christmas, we were just before Christmas, um, start of December, we decided we'd have a bit of a break. Took the caravan up to uh, Gold Coast, taking it a bit easy. We pulled into the caravan park right next to another Anglican minister. I mean, what are the chances of that? He explained to me, he was from a different diocese, he talked about his experience of formation and training. And I realised ours is quite the mess, right? It was, it's just, it's, it's a horrible mess. And um, Ali and I kind of got to the point, we just stopped and we prayed. And we said, hey God, if you can't sell this business, then we're going to have to put this ministry journey on hold until we can resolve that. I get a call the very next day from a big national company and the guy on the phone says, I hear you're trying to sell your business. You want to sell it. I don't want to come and talk to you, meet with you. And I go, okay, great. Goes, I'll fly to wherever you are. Where are you? And I said, I'm, I'm on holidays I'm on the Gold Coast. And he goes, oh, great. I'm on the Gold Coast too. This is a national company. They've got offices in every capital city. I'm on the Gold Coast. Where on the Gold Coast are you? I'm at Treasure Island Calendar, at Caravan Park. I'm five minutes from there. I'll meet you at the pub tonight. And the business was sold. There was no discussion. It was just sold. It was a work of God. It's not just me. It's not just missionaries I talk to. It happens in church all the time. I see someone get up here to preach. The music will fit exactly. There was no communication. The songs will be exactly what we need to lift up the name of Jesus. We see whoever's praying. The same thing happens. Leading in prayers. The same thing happens. It all comes together different Christians without communication, at least not physical or verbal communication for the glory of God. We see it all the time. And every time it happens, it'd be great if I got a dollar because then I'd be rich. Well, I wouldn't, would I? Because I've only been here seven years and seven times 52 is 364. So I'd have $364. But that's still good. I could buy some chocolate. Pretty good. All right. Divine inspiration is a thing. It continues to this day. But there's a but it must be tested. The but is it must be tested. Is what has been spoken in line with God's word? God's not in the habit of contradicting himself. Is the person speaking of good character? Or if we don't know them, does someone come alongside them who we do know of good character to vouch for them? Very important. Do they have anything to gain other than Christ? from the impact of their words, their music, or their prayers? Basically the same two questions we ask of Paul and that he answers. What's he given up in order to speak up? Well, he's given up fame. I mean, we know everyone, Paul's a household name today, surely. But he, that was never his expectation. He was in prison for this. What's he given up to speak up? The fame, the accolade of man, notoriety, the whole bit. And what's he to gain by speaking out? Nothing. In fact, he loses, like I said, he ends up in prison. Let's wrap this up because we want to talk about Paul's authority. He is an apostle sent not from men nor by a man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father. His words recorded in the scriptures carry the weight of Christ's words. Not every word. I mean, sometimes he might say, I want to go to the toilet. I mean, we don't need to worry about that so much. But what is recorded in the scriptures has been tested. The Holy Spirit gave it to us. The church affirmed it. So if it's in the Bible, it is the word of God. That's what matters here. Now, I had a meeting with someone once, and they're talking about their faith. And he said to me, I'll only really follow the red letter bits in the Bible. And I don't know if you've got a modern Bible. Often they just, Jesus' words are, are written in red. I mean, obviously that wasn't the case in Greek, right? But they've written in red and that's all they follow and the rest of it who knows it's a bit kind of it was added on later and all the rest of it and I, I'm just like well if you can just follow the words of Jesus and do that in its entirety then actually I think that's probably enough I reckon if you can do that then the rest will be a walk in the park the rest will be a walk in the park 
Because Paul says nothing to contradict Jesus. All he does is contextualise and expand it with practical examples so we just know how to do things. He never contradicts the Old Testament scriptures. He only ever speaks the word of God to us. Now, it's true that there are a great many progressives out there. There are many churches too, and sadly many in our Anglican diocese, that, and including the devil himself, they would like to delete Paul's letters from the Bible because they are tough. But this faith is no easy faith. Easy to belong will be the easiest thing you ever do. I trust you, Lord Jesus, I want to follow you. But actually walking that path is difficult. It was never meant to be easy. Paul is the real deal. And I think the very fact that recent years people want to delete his letters means it's probably more true than ever. Yes? Yeah, I think so too. I mean, you look at the rise. Oh, we'll talk about that in a minute. What about his motives? His motives are true to Christ. Nothing to gain, everything to nothing earthly to gain, everything to lose. He's got skin in the game. I mean, he puts himself in prison so he can speak the gospel. He cares, he loves, he comes alongside them, he comes alongside us by Christ's word, by the Bible. He never wavers. He speaks of himself with humility. He is the greatest of sinners. I mean, Paul is the greatest of sinners. His setbacks, his failures are recorded in the scriptures. He's not holding anything back. He goes through the hardest of times and he per perseveres. How and why he does this? Because his motives are not of human origin. And lastly, what's his message? Well, his message is divinely inspired, clearly. But he's no island. What he has to say is collaborated by the prophets, by Jesus, by the Old Testament scriptures, by the apostles and the church. I mean, he's going to have a bit of a tussle with Peter and Cephas or Peter in the next chapter, but he is certainly collaborated by them. Not once until recent time have people questioned his authority. And I don't think it's any, any coincidence that this questioning has come at a great time of divergence from the scriptures, particularly in our country in the West. Divergence from the gospel. Sexual immorality at a high, at an all-time high. All manners of sexual perversion, legal and promoted. Abortion, celebrated. Euthanasia. I was reading somewhere, it could have been fake news, but it seems about right, that Canada saved something like 150 million last year thanks to their euthanasia laws. That's a bit odd, isn't it? So what's money? Isn't money meant we make money to, to serve us? Or is the money the thing that we live under? Yeah, I'll leave that one with you. Legalising of serious drugs in many places and the ever-increasing control by the state. Now that last one probably needs a good chat over at morning tea. We can talk about that later. I'll leave it for now. Oh. Well, Paul's word. Paul's word has been taken as gospel and still is taken as gospel by every gospel-believing church. And it's obvious why, because it's true. Paul, like Moses and Jeremiah and Isaiah and Jesus, he is the real deal. And we would do well to listen to what he has to say. Now, let me close with a challenge. Please take the time to read ahead in Galatians. It is a fantastic piece of work and we can learn so much from it. It might take you 15, 20 minutes to read the whole book. It's not a long book. Now I want you to read it with the lens that this is God speaking. So open it up and read it with that lens. This is God speaking and it will change you. And if you've got a huge amount of courage or you really want to be dangerous this week, do the same thing with the first few chapters of the book of Romans. And you will be changed. This is God's work. It has the power to save. And it is his work for us. We better pray. That's my challenge for this week. Read, read Galatians and a little bit of Romans. With the lens that this is God's word. Because it is. Lord we thank you for your great love. We thank you for the scriptures. Tried and tested. Collaborated by the apostles and the Holy Spirit within us. As your word. We just pray 
You bless us as we read it. Amen.